Welcome, everybody, and you're listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I'm honored to have my guest today as Dr. Barbara J. Rolls. Dr. Rolls is professor and the Helen A. Guthrie Chair of Nutritional Sciences at Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Rolls' studies have demonstrated how characteristics of food, such as variety, calorie density, and portion size, can influence energy intake and body weight. She has published more than 250 research articles and six books, including The Ultimate Volumetrics Diet. Dr. Rolls has served as president of both the Society for the Study of Ingestive Behavior and the Obesity Society, has served on the advisory council of the NIH's National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. She has received numerous national and international awards for her research. Please welcome Dr. Rolls. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So do you prefer that I call you Barbara, which is my sister's name? You can just name? call me Barbara. Yeah. I, I, I love that name. Thank you so much. So, so Barbara, normally what we do on Healthy Living is my guest talks the whole time about their work so that people can get to know them and their work. But you are so important to me. If you don't mind, I would just like to take a few minutes since we're just now meeting each other to tell you my story so that you can understand why you and your work is so important to me, if that's all right with you. Terrific. Thank you. So if if there was such a thing as a poster child for volumetrics, I think you're going to agree when you hear my story that I would be it. So in, in, in about two months, I'm going to be 55 years old, and I was overweight or obese almost my entire life till about three years ago when I found your book. At the age of 11, I weighed 160 pounds. Now, I'm 5'6". I'm sure I wasn't 5'6 at 11 years old. So I was already obese as a child, and I maintained that weight or higher most of my life, getting up to almost 200 pounds at a time. Now, I have been vegan for almost 40 years, so one would think, oh, vegan, you're going to be healthy. Well, that doesn't mean you're healthy just because you're vegan, because as a vegan, I ate no fruits and vegetables for the first 43 years of my life. I ate a highly processed junk food vegan diet, sugar, flour, oil, salt. Basically, I ate dessert. That's, you know, and caffeine and sugar, sodas, slurpees, things like that. Twice in my life, I was slim. Now, let me tell you that I am still five foot six, but I have been maintaining my weight successfully and easily, eating more food now than before. I've been maintaining my weight between 117 and 120 pounds. And I did lose the weight without any exercise, but some of the things I learned in your book, I do exercise now. I have lost weight twice in my life before. At the age of 14 to 19, I was anorexic with multiple hospitalizations, and I got down to this weight. Of course, I couldn't sustain that diet. <laughs> it wasn't a very healthy diet. You don't get to eat very much. Of course, I gained all the weight back and then some, and at the age of 35, I was put on FenFen, and I got back down to this weight at that time very easily. But I never really learned anything to eat or about food. And when the FDA pulled that drug, of course, I gained the weight back. I love to go to the movies. And my husband and I go to the movies almost every Friday night. And we love this little theater in Burbank that has a multiplex. And they had recently opened up a, a bookstore in one of the shops where there had been a Halloween costume store. And they called it the Dollar Bookstore. And you could go in this bookstore. And for about the same price as you could get one book for $20, you could come home with 20 books. And about four years ago, for a dollar, I found this book called The Volumetrics Book. And I said, well, this looks interesting. I know. And I feel terrible telling you that. It changed my life for a dollar. It's I worth a lot more than a dollar. I'm going to say that I can send you from what I've learned and from the amount I have now, because what I do is I teach what's called an ultimate weight loss program in Los Angeles. And I give seminars all across the United States. And I give you credit. I, it, I don't say, I don't, I say, I did not invent this. I said, I just teach this, and I always mention you in your book, but I feel that I owe you more than a dollar. So if you give me a dress, I'll put the check in the mail. Because <laughs> what I learned from your book is thousands of dollars, because even though some of the doctors in the plant-based movement basically use your principles of calorie density, specifically Dr. John McDougall in his Maximum Weight Loss book and Dr. Alan Goldhammer in the Health Promoting Diet He Teaches at True North, you explained it so well that I was able to wrap my head around it and finally, finally get it. And just the visuals in your book are so helpful. Like when you show a picture of, well, you could eat uh, a quarter cup of raisins or you could eat two cups of grape. What could you fill, what will fill you up more? And it just, I had already, before I had lost weight, I had already changed my diet about um, 11 years ago because I had gotten the beginnings of colon cancer from eating a junk food vegan diet. So I was already eating healthy foods. I wasn't eating sugar or flour or oil or salt anymore, but I was eating 
calorie dense foods and the the scale didn't budge. And I love in your book when you talk about how rapid weight loss is not the best weight loss because what people don't know, the people that see my before and after that find me on the internet like a wow, but they don't understand that these 47 pounds took me 27 months to lose. I Mm -hmm. lost them very slowly. The first 20 pounds came off very quickly just when I Mm -hmm. stopped eating calorie dense foods like nuts and seeds and peanut butter and avocado and chocolate, but it was very slow and sustained weight loss. I don't understand why people are not shouting volumetrics from the rooftop, why you're not on every show that's about obesity when Dr. Oz has a show. I don't understand why you're, maybe you were in the movie Fed Up, but it's not, you are, you really are, it's my opinion, the leading expert expert on obesity because you have the cure. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the only safe, delicious, and sustainable way to really Mm -hmm. lose weight coming from somebody who has tried every diet. This is the only diet that works. So thank you for your work. How did you discover this? Tell Because some of my listeners may not be familiar with you. They sure will. Who, Who are you exactly? And how did you discover this brilliant system? Okay. Well, basically, I'm a scientist, and you introduced me as a professor of nutritional sciences at Penn State. So I um, study what uh, people eat and how it affects how full and satisfied they feel and how the foods they eat affect their body weight. So my lab has been called a quirky culinary haven for me. We, We basically, my lab is a kitchen, and we feed people. So what we discovered, which was really pretty surprising some years back, was that people tend to eat a pretty consistent weight or volume of food over a day or two. Everybody being focusing on, oh, people manage their calories over a day, so they're going to eat a consistent amount of calories. The weight or volume of food was way more consistent than the calories they were consuming. That is very so helpful to know. In, it was it was a big surprise, and then we started looking. I mean, there were data from um, lab rats that they were doing the same kind of thing. So this looked like it was a pretty sound principle. So once you start to understand that people are eating a pretty consistent amount of food, you realize that the density of the calories in that food is going to make a difference. Mm-hmm. So um, the density varies between fat, carbohydrate, and protein. So fat packs twice as many calories per bite as carbohydrate and protein. Absolutely. The big, the big breakthrough is that the biggest component of food, which has no calories at all, had really been overlooked in the research on and eating I, behavior, I, and that's water. Water, exactly. Water. Water adds weight and volume and no calories at all. So water, if you're going to have a secret magic ingredient, water is it. And, of course, when you look for where the water is, the water is in vegetables, fruits, broth-based soups. I think we're we're thinking of um, more natural foods, the foods right. that um, come to us directly, our fruits, vegetables, et cetera, which is, well, I think, a, lo- a large part of what you're about. Right. Which, well, well, I'm happy to send you a copy of my book because I, I wrote a book in, in 2011 called Unprocessed, and my take uh-huh. is we're not meant to eat processed food. We're meant to eat you know, food from nature, not food that gets manufactured in a plant. So, so that, I only eat um, unprocessed food anyway. Mm-hmm. But, but like I said, if you eat too much calorie dense food, even on an unprocessed diet, that you, you know, you can still be overweight. Because I proved it, you know, for, mm-hmm. for for many years. So you say that people that you discovered in the lab that people eat consistently the same amount of weight or volume of food per day. Now, uh, over a you, day or two, yeah. And and anyway, I mean, I mean, we all know Thanksgiving dinner we eat more. At different occasions we eat more, but it averages out over a couple of days that people right. are somehow managing to eat. Eat a very consistent weight or right. volume of food. And, but, but let me just clarify something. That means, like, I eat the same amount, you eat the same amount. Maybe you and me don't eat the same amount, or maybe right, you, right. Maybe this is within right. within a person. Right. Um, and interestingly, people who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables eat a low calorie density diet. Actually, as you've discovered yourself, um, end up eating more food by weight um, than they did when they were eating 
a higher energy dense I diet. Know. And that's what I that's why I want to shout it from the rooftops because I I don't feel deprived and actually people now look at me like I really have an eating problem because I eat so much food. Mm-hmm. I take yep. big plates of rice and potatoes and beans and I gotta eat so much now to maintain my slimmer body than I did my fat body. You had mentioned in your book that in the, there was a study done at Tufts University, I believe, that the, the category most associated with lower body weight was vegetable intake. Mm-hmm. And the greater variety of vegetables people mm-hmm. ate, the less they weighed. And and that that mm-hmm. right there to me tells tells people that that's really the secret to ultimate weight loss is eat vegetables. Vegetable fruits, yeah. I mean, I I, I wouldn't want to. So, I guess what we need to talk about here is telling people not to eat things like nuts and avocados because they're very healthy. Uh-huh. So in volumetrics, we try not to say don't eat this, eat some things in more moderation than others is really our mantra. So if you want to have satisfying portions, you need to shift towards lower calorie density foods. So the same number of calories in your diet, you're going to get a lot more food if you if you lower the calorie density. But some foods, like nuts, for example, have healthy fats in them, avocados too. So I wouldn't want to say... Right. Don't eat those because we need variety. We seek variety. I just had some avocado myself in a big salad that I had, and it was yummy. But right. you know, it's you're you're managing, you're mixing those in. You're using them as ways to embellish um, other dishes, mixed dishes. Um, or if you're choosing to have nuts, you use some portion control. Right. But but let me just say this because we are just meeting each other. And I'm, I don't tell people not to eat nuts. I know I've been accused of that. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is, a lot of my work that I've done is with people that are considered the world's leading expert in food addiction. And the thing is, is things, these high fat foods are trigger foods mm-hmm. for some of us that are diagnosed mm-hmm. with food addiction. And if we could eat a slice of avocado or an ounce of nuts, we mm-hmm. would have. So some people just can't have those foods around. We're not saying right. they are right. and, healthy. And in the latest volumetrics book, um, the ultimate volumetrics diet, we do have a chapter where we talk about those kinds of trigger foods and different strategies to deal with them. And I agree, you can't you can't lay down strict rules for everybody because we all have different relationships with food. So some people are going to need to just ban those foods. Other people can um, manage somehow to incorporate them into their lives. And and the key is to help people people figure out how they can. Right do it so that they can maintain their healthy eating and their sanity Um, (laughs) mm -hmm. because the best part about about this isn't that i've lost the weight is that is this this is that my brain has completely stabilized and that i just i just the freedom from always having to eat and overeat that for me is is the absolute best part but just just from a, a volumetrics approach see even i was my i was limiting my nuts to just an ounce a day but for Mm -hmm. that 200 calories I can have so much more of so many other things that I personally find so much more satisfying because as an emotional eater and a food addict, I'm a volume eater. And if you're mm-hmm. a vo- volume eater, things like nuts aren't the best thing to eat in volume. Mm-hmm. Right. And and um, volumetrics has actually been tested in people with binge eating disorder. Um, and they did well on it. I mean, um, I think it's yeah. actually probably the cure because one of the things about us bingers is we like mm-hmm. to eat a large volume of food, and by following your approach, we we can. And but mm-hmm. it's not going to hurt us, and it's actually it's actually going to be very very healthy for us to do so as well. What was the most surprising thing you found in your research? Oh, the most surprising. Well, I I do think this this idea that people eat a consistent weight or volume is was very surprising, and the the whole area that I work in, as you know, weight management is organized around fat, carbohydrate, and protein, and shifting the proportions of those in the diet. That's really what what this field is all about, and. When we have held calorie density constant and manipulated the proportions of fat, carbohydrate, and protein, they don't affect um, how much people eat. But if you, um, when you vary calorie density, no matter what the macronutrient proportion, it's going to affect intake. So calorie density has much more robust effects on how much you eat than yeah. the proportions of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And that that's where we're, where you're saying, why isn't everybody sh- sh- outing this from the rooftops? 
that is, uh, it's a big shift in thinking in the eating field and the weight management field. And a lot of people have vested interests in thinking a different way. Right. So, you you know, you if you make um, some new discoveries, it's, it's, it takes some time, right. uh, but a lot of the the main diets that are out there that are um, being promoted are a lot of them are based on the idea of lowering um, calorie density. I mean, things like the Mediterranean diet. I mean, that really is basically pretty low in energy density. Obviously, they have the nuts and the olive oil and whatnot, mm-hmm. but in general, they're promoting a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, so. Uh, I I think that it it's it's slowly coming in. The dietary guidelines for America has um some uh energy density um information which they didn't ten years ago. I went and testified to them and it was too soon then. Uh-huh. Um so you know it's it's a it's a sea change. But the thing about calorie density that is really appealing to me, first of all it leads you to really nutritious food choices. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be restrictive. There are a whole lot of different ways you can vary the calorie density of your diet. So it's flexible. Um, and it it's a lifestyle thing. It's really something that um, anybody can use. And it's really a different way of, of thinking about eating. Well, that's, that's what I love about it is because, mm-hmm. like you say, it's not it's not a just do what I say. It can be used for many of the different style, diet styles. I happen to be an unprocessed sugar, oil, salt-free mm-hmm. vegan, and it works well for me, but it could work well for other people, and that's what I love about it. Did, now, did you invent this, or did you just pioneer this work and make it really, um, you know, it, it, what it is today? Well, there's been talk about um, calorie density in the scientific literature for years. I didn't invent the term. I mean, scientific term is energy density. With the public, I like to talk about calorie density Mm because it's a little bit more accessible. But Mm -hmm. no, we just have done a lot of the basic research. And then, of course, through my volumetrics books, have been really translating it into practical advice that people can apply to their own diets. And in terms of my story, I grew up with an obese, binge-eating mother. Same here. Um, and I actually did not know until um, late in her life that she had actually used Ipecac as a child to purge, I mean, as oh. a, a young girl, which back in her day must have been pretty much unheard of. Right. Um, so she obviously had big eating problems when she was staying at my house food would disappear and she would always deny eating it. It would disappear Mm -hmm. in the night. So from the time I was a graduate student, I was determined that I was going to write a diet book, that I wanted to try to do something about this to help people. So it was on my mind for a long time. I still have drafts from the diet book I would have written back when I was a a student, which would have been way focused on fat reduction and that kind of thing, because that's what we all believed um, some years ago, and uh, you know, I when we were really just beginning to understand the impact of calorie density, wrote the first volumetrics book that was in 2000, um, and since I've written two more. Uh, right. There was the volumetrics weight control plan, then the volumetrics eating plan, and then the ultimate volumetrics diet. And I was I was hoping ultimate meant last. My um, <laughs> editor it doesn't necessarily interpret it that way. <laughs> <laughs> ultimate could be the best, right? That's so um, funny. I'm calling my next book the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and 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 I didn't even realize that was one of the the words adjectives in your book. You know, if people are unfamiliar with your work and they wanted to buy one of those books, is there one that you would recommend maybe they buy first of all the volumetric books? Um, yeah, they're all a little different. The first one um, is um, it's got a lot of pros, fewer pictures. It's really setting out the science. It's it's good. It's got a lot of um, stories. I did it with a journalist. Um, the next one has much less of the science, lots of wonderful recipes. Now we're into color pictures. It's a short plan. Um, 
the latest one, the Ultimate Volumetrics Diet, is a 12-week plan. has wonderful recipes. Um, I hope you, as a chef, feel the same. Um, we really commandeered friends and family to give us their favorites and then adapted them. Um, well, next time, the, next time, ask me for recipes because all my recipes absolutely. Are- <laughs> next time, you, I can't believe you said next time. Oh no! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 well, I'm sure you've realized that writing books is challenging, and, and nowadays with people eager to get advice from other sources than books, it's it's very challenging. It's so much easier to talk than to type. That's what I always say to people. <laughs> so talk a little bit about this concept of eating ad libitum, which means eating all you can, because I have found, and you can tell me if the research backs this up, is that I I choose to eat and my ultimate weight loss program for people just for the first 21 days. Cause again, I don't tell them that they can never have nuts or seeds or I don't tell them they can never have anything. I say, just try eating this way for 21 days is we focus on the foods that are not only the highest in nutrient density, but the lowest in calorie density, the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains and legumes, which are basically foods that are between 100 and 600 calories mm-hmm. per pound. Mm-hmm. And I have heard from many people that teach this, that if you keep the calorie density, or should I say the average calorie density of your food to 600 calories per pound per day, you can eat ad libitum, which means you can eat pretty much all you want whenever you want, and not only not be overweight, but actually get down to pretty much your lean weight. Do you, do you, do you agree with that, that saying? Um, I, to a certain extent, I mean, we need more um, randomized clinical trials in this field. That's, I mean, clearly that's the gold standard. We did do a year-long trial where we compared the traditional weight loss advice, um, which was to restrict fat and to manage your portions and to eat fewer calories. We compared that to a condition where we gave people advice about calories. They didn't count calories, um, but they were told in that program to eat as much fruit and vegetable soups as they wanted. So it was a positive messaging kind of approach. Now, both groups lost weight, but the group that was eating as as much as they wanted of the lower calorie density, fruits and vegetables and whatnot, lost significantly more weight, felt fuller, had less hunger, and maintained the weight better. And we're eating a much more nutrient-rich diet. Um, so that that was very positive. There have been some other studies where we've looked at um, what the, the DASH diet and looked at um, 700 people and from different centers that were doing that diet, and we found the people that lost the mo- most weight over the first six months were eating the lower, the lowest energy density diet, and they were eating about a pound a day more food than the um, that, that's, people. See, to yeah. me, that that's see, see, I, if, if this is the sales pitch, Barbara. Is is that mm-hmm. especially for people like us, these uh, food addicts or food addicts in recovery? To me, that's that was the hook. And and I think one of the things I I try to explain to my listeners is that Americans right now we have an obesity epidemic. I'm sure you're aware mm-hmm. of it, especially a childhood obesity epidemic. One out of every three children under the age of 18 is already obese, and uh, two thirds of Americans are overweight and half of those are obese, and yet it shows that Americans eat 92% of their calories from animal products and processed food and less than 10% from fruits and vegetables. And I think one of the biggest take-home messages, and this is where all the guests I have agree, is that we as a society need to eat more fruits and vegetables because that Mm -hmm. solves so many of our problems. And fruits and vegetables with a calorie density of 100 to 300 calories a pound, you can't overeat on them. I mean, you cannot overeat on vegetables. It's impossible. I eat almost four pounds of vegetables a day. People think I'm crazy. In my program, I tell people to eat too, and they have trouble with that. I mean, people aren't eating any vegetables. Well, part of the problem is when we get vegetables when we're eating out, they're slathered in stuff, yeah, often cheese, swimming in oil. some kind of weird oil. And they really, I think that, and you're a chef, so you know more about this than I do. I think chefs think that that's what we want. And clearly, some people must want that, or they wouldn't keep putting that on our plates. Um, so that's a big problem. So you tell people to eat more fruits and vegetables, but what they're being offered is not really what you and I have in mind. 
Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I, I mean, I worked in a restaurant, and the thing is, is what, restaurants use more sugar, fat, and salt than you mm-hmm. ever would at home. And right. They're our, easy. They're cop-outs. They're easy um, options for them, well, just well, playing well, to the basic uh, like for those. And it, it, we really need cuisine rather than sugar, salt, and fat. Right. Well, have, are you familiar with the work of either Michael Moss or uh, David mm-hmm. Kessler? Because yeah, in sure. both of their mm-hmm. books, they talk about how sugar, fat, and salt is addictive. Mm-hmm. But when you put them together, they're even more so. And restaurants make these hyper-palatable foods, I think, so mm-hmm. people like it more, they'll eat more, and they'll, and they'll buy more. I mean, I, I, that's, that's my opinion. And I think it takes a while for people to neuroadapt from a diet that's so high in sugar, fat, and salt to the simpler taste of whole natural food. And, and that's, I think, what, what, what happens is because if you're, you know, if you're being offered a, you know, a, a pepperoni pizza, you know, well, some steamed broccoli doesn't taste very good, you know? That's true. The whole issue of food addiction is a whole other show, though, and it's yeah. very controversial. Yeah. I, I, we, we really love sugar, salt, and fat. Whether we get addicted to it or not is right. a topic of very hot debate but, but, in but, but the fields that I work in. But let me say this, because that's funny, because mm-hmm. I'm interviewing Kay Shepard, who's another leading expert mm-hmm. today, and, and I interviewed Dr. Joan Islin last week. We may love it, but as somebody mm-hmm. who hasn't eaten any sugar, fat, and salt in a very long time, if you don't eat it, you can learn to love food without it. I have mm-hmm. met people, because I, I speak all over the world, and I have met people from Ethiopia that have never eaten processed food, that love, that the way that I eat now, which is considered extreme, they just call it food in their country. Mm-hmm. So that's- well, that's great. And I think that that's obviously what we have to aim to do is to get people so that they actually change their preferences so that they can sustain eating the healthy foods. That's, that's our ultimate goal. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and that, it doesn't happen to everybody. We know that if you sure. do long-term follow-up. But obviously, in the end, we've got to get people so that they want to eat the healthy food. They're demanding the right. healthy food. And if if they demand it, then we'll get more of it. We may have to pay a bit more. That's, <laughs> you know, that's where, but that's where people bulk at it, you know. The people, in America particularly, we love value. People like to get the maximum calories for their buck. We right. call it the calibuck ratio, kind of jokingly. <laughs> that's, that's, you know? I love that, the calibuck ratio, you know. Yeah. But, but also, do you, do you, I mean, from what I've learned from one of my mentors, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, is that the dopamine reward cascade plays a lot into this because you don't get the amount of dopamine released when you eat broccoli as you do when you eat, you know, peanut butter. And so... So it's, how do you feel about that, that the more calorically dense? Oh, the- oh, right. I mean, there are, there are definitely pleasure responses to food and whatnot. The issue comes to whether that leads to addiction. Addiction has very specific terms. Um, I don't really want to get into that because, right. it's, as I say, it's it's very complex sure. and the arguments are 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 dense. They're very sciencey. Um, well, we I know here at, here at Penn State, there's a food addiction course that's taught, and they very much take the tack that there isn't firm proof of food addiction. Okay. Sure, we that's love we love these uh, the sugar, salt, and fat, but to actually move that into an addiction is a leap that the science from the point of view of a lot of people does not support. Right. So, but it doesn't I'm, support it yet. It doesn't mean it won't ever support it. Oh, yeah. Science is um, it's ever the changing. state of the art wherever we are in our understanding and it changes all the time. And and that in terms of nutrition obviously frustrates the general public um, because boy, nutrition is so complex. You know, you're trying to look at the um, massive interactions between all of the different components of foods and diets and figuring out what the key elements are. It's it's tricky. Uh, and we also have um, pressure where the media often pounces on things that are controversial or outside of what we normally think and plays those up. And then you get the, oh, we should eat more fruits and vegetables. That that doesn't get much play because people are bored by that. They've heard that before. And so also, it's very frustrating in this field. If only we could get the top people in nutrition to be promoting what we know about healthy eating and consistently promoting it, the public would really benefit. Also, 
also, I think that things like fruits and vegetables aren't subsidized the way the dairy and the meat and all these other industries are. I mean, we, but I don't want to get into that either because your work, just the science is what really excites me about your work because it's such a doable plan. It will help so many people regardless of what their current diet style is if they just add more calorie dilute foods, water rich mm-hmm. foods to their diet. Are you familiar with the National Weight Loss Registry run by mm-hmm. Dr. James yeah. Hill? So, so because mm-hmm. I have sustained an over 30 pound weight loss for two years, I'm, I'm, I'm in this prestigious oh, group of people, thanks to uh-huh. you. And one of the things I read on their website is something like 98% of people that lose weight gain it all back within two years. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the problem is, is that most diets re- require you to, to restrict, to restrict portions, to restrict carbs, to restrict calories. But the volumetric approach doesn't require restriction. It requires, it, it's freedom because you don't, you get to eat satisfying portions. And you had mentioned that when you see a large volume of food, it increases your expectations that you will feel satisfied at the end of the meal. So there's no skimpy portions. And by eating more food, your meal lasts longer and you'll receive more pleasure. And it's, it's just to me so exciting that it's just a, it, 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 there's no deprivation in the volumetrics approach. It's it's quite the opposite. Right. And so the whole eat less message drives me a bit nuts because we don't want people just to think that they need to eat less of everything. That then conjures up an image of a half-empty plate. People immediately think, I'm not going to be getting enough food. I'm not going to be satisfied. So we need to make it very clear that People can eat their usual amount of food if they lower the calorie density. They can have a full plate um, when they're managing their weight. And that message, it's obviously more complex than simply telling people to eat less. But eat less, people don't like to hear that. They don't don't want negative messaging. So we need really to work to convincing people that they can have a full plate while they're um, maintaining or even losing Wait. And, you know, over 30 years ago, Dr. Jean Ornish wrote a book that, that is basically volume mm-hmm. interest approach called Eat More, Weigh Less. His is very low fat, though. Mm-hmm. It's it's different. It's a very low fat diet because obviously it's, it, he was looking Reversing at cardiovascular heart. disease right. and his, his diet is um, nowadays considered very low because um, the emphasis on eating, I mean, he's he's down at 10% of calories from fat. And Me the too. recommendation now is more like 30 to 35%, but the focus has shifted from just restricting fat to the focus on the healthy fats. Um, so there's been, a, in, in nutrition circles, a real sea change from just eat less fat to no, you can eat fat, but make it healthy. The problem, of course, that you'll immediately perceive is fat is calorie dense. So when you're when you're eating fat, the healthy fats, you need to do it selectively. You need to use the fat in ways that are going to enhance the flavors and foods. We actually have in the Ultimate Volumetrics Diet, we have a lot of tips on how to incorporate the healthy fats into your diet without um, eating a high calorie density diet because that's that's the um, puzzle that a lot of people are are facing. Um, well, what I've always recommended to people if, in my first book, if they're going to eat fat, eat whole food fats found in nature, like nuts, seeds, nut butters, mm-hmm. and avocado, rather mm-hmm. than processed oils. Because even then, uh, oil has a calorie density of four thousand calories a pound. Seeds are about twenty six hundred calories a pound, and infinitely healthier things. So, so, so that's that's already you know shifting it to a little bit of a lower calorie density. You know. Um, one of the things that I loved in your book was the story you told about when you went to this pasta tasting dinner in Italy and oh. all these courses. <laughs> and I learned so much um, about what you call sensory specific society. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things I've always taught the people in my program was that variety, I've always known this instinctively, that variety was the kiss of death for the for a food addict. Because when there's umpteen choices and you taste everything, you've already overeaten. Can you talk a little bit about this sensory specific satiety? Right. Well, <laughs> this uh, meal that I went to in Italy was really so great for me because I had been studying the effects of variety on eating for years. So they bust us off to a mountaintop um, and we waited for hours for this dinner, which turned out to be 13 courses of pasta. Um, it was the I. Uh, and it was an Italian joke for these, um, you know, people who study eating and drinking behavior. 
So what happened was the first three, four courses, everybody is eating enthusiastically. And then we get to course six or seven, and they announce that this is a special pasta that everybody in Italy is clamoring to get. It's made by some famous car designer and blah, 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 blah. But at this point, everybody had pasta-specific satiety. They (laughs) just had had enough pasta. It didn't matter if the shape was different, if the sauce was different, whatever. So people got up. They started wandering around. And the 13 courses played out with people eating less and less. And then they brought the dessert. Everybody jumps back to their places and is gobbling up the dessert. So what happens as we eat is that the food that we're eating starts tasting, looking, smelling um, less good than at the start of the meal. But other foods that have very different sensory properties, so if you're eating a salty, savory kind of food, um, sweet food is going to still taste good, whereas other salty, savory foods are also going to decline somewhat in pleasantness. So that's why we we like dessert. And a lot of the structure of meals um, in our society is organized around keeping us eating. The success of courses with different uh, sensory qualities is really to keep you eating. Once a food gets neutral in terms of pleasantness of taste, you're going to stop eating it. Mm -hmm. So if you shift around and you get all of these different sensory experiences, you will keep eating. Um, And so that obviously can be good uh, if you're eating in a fancy restaurant and you want to keep eating. But if you're trying to manage your weight, obviously continuing to eat because of the variety of the sensory qualities can be a problem. I I found that that not having so much variety at meals has really been one of my secrets of managing Mm -hmm. weight. And and I'm very satisfied with with less choices, and I just make the choices that I do have, you know, very delicious. So so let's talk about something that's, I think, almost as important as water, and that's fiber. You talk about Mm -hmm. how fiber slows the passage of food through the digestive system so that satiety signals are stimulated for longer. So... Again, the processed foods that a lot of Americans eat, you know, chips and cookies, no fiber, animal products, no fiber, but the fruits and the vegetables and the whole grains, Mm -hmm. these are packed with water and fiber. So why is not just water, but water and fiber so important to this weight loss approach? Yeah, well, as you said, fiber can have um, effects in terms of slowing down the transit of foods, filling you up, bulking up um, foods, even attracting water into your gut after you've eaten it. It also, high fiber foods often require more chewing, Mm -hmm. so they slow you down. Um, There's more sensory experience with the high fiber foods. Um, What's happening now with a lot of the food industry is because they're very interested in satiety and they know that um, there's some research showing that fiber can help to enhance satiety. Just Fibers that are um, not the kind that are naturally in foods are being added to foods. Mm. Um, And we don't really know that they're going to have the same kinds of effects. They certainly don't have the oral processing effects because usually they're powders. Um, So we we need to be um, eating foods that are low in calorie density that are also rich in fiber for maximal um, satiety effects for all these these reasons of of the sensory stimulation as well as the uh, potential GI effects. But there's also health benefits to eating fiber. Absolutely. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like little cleansers to our colon. And, mm-hmm. and, yep. and fiber also has no, it adds no calories. It just adds bulk, which, which helps. Um, no, it has some calories. It has about two and a half um, calories per gram because some of it is present. It depends on the type of fiber. It's not as digested as just pure carbohydrate, but it is digested a bit, so you get some calories out of it. Um, And it doesn't, uh, overall, it's not going to have a huge impact on the calorie density of your diet because we just can't eat enough of it to to really, I mean, mean, the recommendation is about um, 35 grams a day for an adult. I mean, most of us are not getting anywhere near that, but that's that's not going to have a huge impact on our overall diet, which is going to be a couple of pounds of food. 
Well, you said that, that, that when you eating, eating, you had just said a few minutes ago that when you eat fiber, it requires more chewing and mm-hmm. more chewing yeah. comes more satisfaction. Mm-hmm. I find that to be completely true that I find that liquid calories, regardless of what they are, whether they're a, a, mm-hmm. a, a designer coffee drink or even a healthy smoothie, are just not as satisfying to me in the long mm-hmm. term. Because yeah, because so we did a study a few years back um, where we had people um, eat at the start of a meal either whole apple, um, applesauce that we made ourselves at, from the same apples. We bought all the apples from the same producer, blah, blah, blah. And then we also had apple juice. And most people may not know that the juice that you buy basically has no fiber in it. Even pulpy orange juice doesn't have any really noticeable fiber. So we had two juices. We had the kind of apple juice you would buy with no fiber, and then we added pectin into another glass of juice that was matched for calories to the apple or applesauce. And the pectin was designed to be the level that you would get from the whole apple. So we had people eat the same calorie amounts of these different fruit forms before a meal on four different weeks. And then we looked at how much drinking or eating the different apple forms affected consumption at the next course. This is how we study satiety in our our field. You give a what we call preload. It's just a fancy name for a first course, and then you look at how that impacts hunger and fullness and intake right after. And we found that when people had the whole apple, they ate um, 20% less at the meal. It was really a, a big effect. The applesauce had a bit of an effect in reducing subsequent intake, and the juices um they they were not compensated for at all in terms of the calories from the juice so certainly in terms of satiety and there are other studies that support this whole um fruit um whole vegetables are going to be more satiating than the liquid forms I, I thank you for saying that because I recently released a video to that effect, and I'm going to send mm-hmm. it to you because I, I, I had no if I had known about this study, I could have added the fact that the whole apple reduced the mm-hmm. time by 20 percent. That and so satiety just means the end of hunger, right? The feeling of satisfaction that we get at the end of a meal, and is right, that how you define right. Yeah. But but we um, in terms of how we operationalize it, how we test it in the lab, we do it with this fixed amount of something, a preload, and then we look at how it affects subsequent eating. I would love to come to your lab. You know, I had Brian <laughs> Wansink on the other night, and he said I could come to the Cornell Food Lab. I wish you would study me because, you know, I, I'm, I went to Penn, University of Pennsylvania. Oh, so, so did I. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's, we have yeah, fun. we're pen pals. <laughs> That's great. I would love to. I would love to come and see your work. It's it just. It just sounds so fascinating. You know, we talked about satiety a minute ago. Are you familiar with Dr. Susanna Holt, who developed the satiety? Sure. Yes. 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 So, um, if you know, I'm a skeptic. Right? I'm a skeptic. Oh, skeptic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because um, measuring satiety is way more complex than in with her satiety score. So she gives a fixed amount of calories and looks at one time point after she's done that and so she's not she she didn't um adjust for calorie density and all the other properties of foods that can affect satiety so really to rank foods the way she did um i liked what she found she found that the lowest calorie density foods had the highest um satiety rating um, so I liked her findings, but I didn't like her method of getting well, there because you I really like- need to look at the time course of things. You need to look at different calorie loads. It's just it's not that easy. It's more complex. Do, do you know her personally? Mm-hmm. I would love to have her on the show because, you know, what her finding was and because I, and my book on process has a potato on the cover was that the most satiating food was the potato. And I was like, yep, that was so I was very happy with her findings, too. But what? What I wanted to mention is, and you mentioned this in your book, is people worry so much about the glycemic index when mm-hmm. that really doesn't make such a difference, with, especially with weight loss, because, you know, the glycemic index of haagen you know, chocolate, chocolate chip ice cream is quite low compared to carrots, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but the calorie density is quite different. So could you talk, because people so worry about, oh, the, well, the glycemic, you know, talk, because most people don't just eat one food. Most people don't eat just mm-hmm. a potato. I eat potatoes. Well, Right. I mean, the thing about the glycemic index is it is only for carbohydrates anyway. So, um, and it doesn't, when you get into mixed meals, it gets very complex and it's affected by the temperature of foods, by the cooking methods 
that's being used for foods. Um, it's just it's a very impractical way to evaluate what you're eating, and it hasn't really been shown to relate to weight management in a clear way. It's again, that's a very hot topic for debate in our field. And people tend to do either or. So they say, well, either you're going to use glycemic index as the guide for your food choices for weight management, or you're going to use calorie density. The fact is that if you follow calorie density, you're pretty much going to be eating a pretty low glycemic index diet because, you know, we're, we're, recommending that people eat um, more whole foods, more fruits and vegetables. Um, so I think these kinds of debates where people have to pick, this is the diet, this is what I'm going to follow, um, is it's really not what's going to be helpful for the general public. We We need people to uh, understand that it's, it is complex, and and sure, if if you've got diabetes, maybe you're going to want to um, know something about glycemic index and and uh, manage your carbs. But for weight management, um, perhaps you're going to want to focus on calorie density because you, you're going to be able to eat a lot of food that is in general healthy. And Can it's I gonna just get say you. this? I'd like to nominate you for Surgeon General. Is that <laughs> yeah, right? Or, I, I mean, is, 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 can I nominate people, or will they not uh, accept? No, I, you have to ask me if I want to do it. I don't think so. I'm I, not. I wouldn't want to get into your, politics. It's um, but yeah. You, you make your head I, against the wall every day that people don't know what you're teaching. Why aren't you on Oprah? I mean, I know I could get Oprah thin if she wants to be, because all you have to do is what you say in your book. I mean, it's that easy. Why isn't this book like a number one bestseller in the New York Times like all the time? I don't. Well, understand. it has been. It did get to be number one at one point uh, well, when should, Consum- Consumer Reports picked it as the top diet in the country in 2007, and then it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Well, but as, as it's should, tough because you know I'm not giving people magic. I'm I'm giving people what we know from the science and then making it practical and. Unfortunately, people want um, gimmicks. They want quick fixes. They they don't want to hear really that they need to change towards yeah, eating they, more fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And whatnot. they don't want to change I, their lifestyle. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They want their life to change, but they don't want to change their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Dr. McDougall, who mm-hmm. I had on the program, said people are always looking for good news about their bad habits. And mm-hmm. it, it's just incredible to me that we have the books that are number one are the paleo type books. And mm-hmm. that's completely unsustainable. It's completely unsatisfying. These people are constipated all the time and have all kinds of program uh, problems. I, I mean, it's not it's not based on what you teach at all. Can you explain? And I think you do in your book a little bit about why these 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 diets to completely restrict carbohydrates are not only unhealthy but unsustainable and they're they're favorable for weight loss in the short term because you lose water but mm-hmm. everybody that I know that has been on these diets they can't sustain it they end up gaining more back and with your program it's completely sustainable because the way you eat after you lose weight is the same way you ate when you were losing weight but you didn't even know you were losing weight mm-hmm. well and that's right and so obviously what what you've done personally was um you made some pretty dramatic changes, but I want to emphasize people don't have to do that. So what we do in this latest book is we show people the way they can change what they're currently eating towards a lower calorie density. So they don't have to be counting and looking at the calorie density of everything. They just need to find where they can add fruits and vegetables, where they can take a little bit of the unnecessary fat out, where they can take the sugar out, um, so that it accumulates. So your your whole diet is getting lower in calorie density, and you're still eating your favorite foods. You've tweaked them so that they still taste just as good, and that's really important. Obviously, if the food doesn't taste good, people are never going to sustain it. So often, people are following these diets, which are very extreme, asking them to give up their favorite foods, I mean, bread and pasta. I can't imagine life without it. Um, And clearly, they're all gung-ho, and they can do it for a while, but in the end, you just can't do that we're omnivores for goodness sakes we we and we have established eating habits from early life so uh, expecting people to make extreme changes forever that don't taste good that don't fit with what they really want to do is not reasonable so what i think you and i have the same goal we've got to help people figure out 
how they can move towards a nutrient-dense, lower-calorie-dense diet that they enjoy so that it becomes the default. It becomes what they want to do, and it, then it's just a no-brainer. It's it's the way they want to eat, and they're not eating every meal as if it's the last one on earth so that they have to gobble up everything in sight, which is often, I think, the way people are these days. I appreciate you saying we have the same goals because really at the end of the day, regardless of my political or, or beliefs or diet, my goal is to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables, and I do believe that I can make it taste delicious, and, and that's really at the end of the day mm-hmm. what I'm trying to get people to do. So, but but it, we talk a little bit about these paleo type diets because we need carbohydrate. I mean, our whole species evolved on a diet high in complex carbohydrates, which are different, by the way, than refined carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I guess I just don't get it. I think that <laughs> when you look at the history of dieting, it it changes. So every few years we have a different fad, and that just happens to be what the fad is now. Um, I haven't tried to eat like a Neanderthal, um, <laughs> so I don't think I really want to. I I I don't get it, um, but, you know, it's, again, this, this search for um, magic. So. You know, we've talked about lowering the energy density or the calorie density of the diet. And in, in case there are people listening that don't really understand this concept, we know that protein and carbohydrate are four calories a gram, mm-hmm. that alcohol is seven calories a gram, and that mm-hmm. fat is almost is more than double calorically dense, mm-hmm. nine calories a gram. And you had mentioned in your book that decreasing the amount of fat you eat decreases the overall energy density of diet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That high fat foods are easy to overeat on because they pack a lot of calories in a small portion. That mm-hmm. we learn to like high fat foods at a young age because they are energy dense and rapidly reduce hunger. Mm-hmm. Now, here's, here's what you say that's really interesting to me. Well, everything you say is interesting to me, but you will gain more weight on a high fat diet than a high carbohydrate diet because the body is less efficient at converting excess carbohydrate calories into body fat mm-hmm. than it is at converting excess high calories from fat. And that is basically on the same page as all the people in the plant-based world that we study with. And can you, ex- and, and there's, there's something mm-hmm. de novo lipogenesis or something. Cause I, yeah, well, if you're eating fat, that fat can pretty quickly go straight to body fat. So it doesn't take a lot of energy or calories to do the conversion to convert um, protein or carbohydrate to body fat does use a bit more energy, but it's not very much. I mean, that's the thing that, you know, a lot of these diets are based on these huge metabolic differences between the macronutrients and they're not really that big. They're, They're tiny compared to the amount of calories you can save simply by shifting to a lower calorie density diet. But, um, so but let's talk about alcohol for a minute because I work mm-hmm. with a lot of people, uh, you know, like privately, mm-hmm. and at least mm-hmm. in my practice, especially for women, I find that women that won't stop drinking at least a lot, it's much mm-hmm. harder to get them to lose weight because alcohol acts a little bit differently in the body, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, alcohol and fat combined um, are pretty problematic because when you're drinking alcohol, the fat in your diet really more readily than ever if it's in excess of your calorie needs is going to go straight to body fat. So, um, yeah, so that's why the alcohol is somewhat problematic. The studies on alcohol and food intake are, we need a lot more because often the studies that have been done don't discriminate between wine and beer and what the people might be eating along with these beverages. And there's always been this intriguing Um, population-based data that women who drink alcohol don't end up heavier than those who don't, but men do. Mm. Um, Yeah, and I suspect that a lot of that is to do with what is being eaten along with the alcohol. Right. Um, But, you know, that studying alcohol, it's tough. Lots of um, ethical restrictions, and if you're just asking people about their alcohol consumption, there's a lot of lying, uh, <laughs> lot of yes, deception. Not really wanting to admit that you're sitting at home every night uh, sucking down a bottle of wine on your own or whatever. So. Maybe I should. 
phrase this. The clients that I've worked with that are willing to give up alcohol have had an easier time becoming slim and managing their weight than those that don't. So would that be a better mm-hmm. phrase? It's just, yeah. Yeah, and it would be, I mean, <laughs> clinical trial data, the the randomized trial data on that are, are missing, though. There aren't a yeah. lot of actual data. So, um, I mean, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Can I go into the scientific literature and, and find a lot to back that up? Yeah. Because people aren't, they're not doing those kinds of studies. It's just right. really hard. Right. Well, you know, you I, I love that you say, because so much of what you say, I don't know if I've just, um, um, what's the word, like when absorbed it and it's just, I channel it when I teach, but you say don't recommend weighing during the active weight loss. And I, I agree. I think that when people start out, it may be good to know what they weigh so that they can see how far they come. But I always tell people, don't weigh yourself while you're losing weight because some people lose inches first. Don't weigh yourself. But you say, but but weigh yourself during maintenance. And I find that that's really, really important. Let me say that that's in the first thing. So the, the, since then, there have been um, a number of studies, I mean, particularly from Rena Wing's lab that have shown that daily weighing actually leads to um, better maintenance. Yeah. Um, and and so. I do. People say, oh, you're going to be you're anorexic now. You know, it's so funny. You, you want to hear something funny? So when I, you know, I used to, I hate to admit this because my list, well, it's going to come out in my next book, but I even used to smoke cigarettes. I never drank alcohol, but I did anything to keep my weight down, you know, when I was in college. Mm-hmm. But when I was, uh, you know, 180 pounds and when I was smoking and when I was eating at McDonald's, no one said anything to me. But now that I'm slim and eating kale, it's like everybody is a critic, you know, like it, mm-hmm. it's, it's hilarious, you know. How mm-hmm. people, um, just you know, it, it's like you get criticized now for being slender and healthy. It, it, it's weird to me, but um, you know, you had mentioned, and I find this to be true, that losing weight is easier than keeping it off, and and to prov- and, and this is one of the reasons. And I got to tell you, you, I really should be sending you like all my money because <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't I, when I make it. But you say that to maintain weight loss and prevent weight gain, you need to increase physical activity, that for weight management, the important thing is the total number of calories you burn. And, you know, I'm going to, I was a couch potato for the first 52 years. I, I've only started exercising recently. And when I read that in your book and corroborated by Dr. Hill's research in the National Weight Loss Registry, mm-hmm. that every single person that successfully lost weight and maintained the 30 pound weight loss for at least two years, they did it from different diets, anywhere from like gastric bypass to vegan diets to all kinds of diets. But one of the things they all had in common is they did exercise. And then when I heard that, I realized that I better start uh, exercising, and I do now. And so, th- so thank you for saying that so much. You know that uh, that was very helpful. Well, it also, if you um, exercise, it shows a commitment to a healthier lifestyle in general. So you know, it's it's about that as well. If you're going to maintain the healthy habits, it's good not only to focus on what you're eating, but also. Um, there are a lot of reasons to be physically active that don't have anything to do with your body weight, as there are a lot of reasons to eat healthy that don't have anything to do with right. body weight. And, and I think alcohol, alcohol, oh, my God, Freudian slip, I was going to say alcohol, exercise improves self-esteem. I think it makes you feel about your, better, better, better about yourself regardless of your weight. So I think it's a really good thing mm-hmm. to do you know, when people can. I don't want to be contrary to anyone, any other guests I have, but I do have to mention one thing you say in your book, which is a little bit different than a couple of the past guests I've had. One was a Nassau scientist who actually studied this with all kinds of equipment while he was fasting for three weeks. And again, I don't, I don't want to ever put one guest, guest against each other. I'm just trying to learn. But you say that metabolism slows while we sleep. The process of digesting food revs it up. Skipping breakfast slows rate at which you burn calories. Mm-hmm. Now, now, that's what you say, and I'm not arguing it. But I- that's that's in the 2000 book. So there's been a lot of recent research on breakfast consumption, uh, and a lot of debate about whether it does that. So, and I mean, that's there, there's some schools of thought now that are saying, mm-hmm. and this is not for everybody, but what they're saying is that some of that research done where it said breakfast is the most important meal of the day mm-hmm. was done by the, the, the processed cereal industry, and what they did is they pitted, pitted, pitted children who had no food against those that had food, and it was it was very skewed science, but then in some people, and I'm not talking about people that have a lot of weight to lose, but people that are getting down to their last 20, 10 to 20 pounds, that it's better not necessarily... Any any meal you eat is breakfast because it's break fast, but that there's a school of thought that we shouldn't necessarily just eat by the clock when we wake up, 
if we're not hungry. And it's sometimes delaying that first meal of the day is actually a little bit more favorable to weight loss. And that there is a school of thought that it's calories in, calories out, that it doesn't matter how many calories we eat in the course of the day. But, you know, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who was a previous guest on the show, saying that it, that night eating is less favorable, that those calories that you eat after dinner, which is a lot of those emotional eaters, what they do, there's no way those calories can be burned, and so they're stored as fat. So if you have anything to say about that, I'd love to hear it. Well, we could do a whole show on all of this because it's, it's very complex. And as you say, I think you're looking at the, the book written in 2000. Um, in Just in the last year, there's been a flurry of research around breakfast and the benefits because most of the work that had been done by 2000 was from population-based data, looking just at self-reported breakfast consumption and whether that was associated with a particular um, weight status. So now there actually are clinical trials coming out looking at breakfast consumption. And at the moment, it's pretty mixed results, with some saying their benefits and some saying not. So I think that we we need to. I mean, the attention is is there now, and the studies are being done, but they hadn't been done. So you know, as we've said, science is evolving, and right. uh, yeah. it's the the verdict is not out, and I suspect it's going to vary between individuals too. That's true. You know, there again, are this is... differences. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm going to just ask you one more question and I so appreciate your time and I hope you will come back and not only come back on the podcast, but maybe on a live webinar because you, you, you're it, you're, you're the it girl. I mean, man, I, how do people find you? I mean, do you have a website? Do you have a Facebook presence that people want? Um, there's a, a Facebook uh, for the ultimate volumetrics diet. Um, great. Great. And 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 then they can find all your books. I'm sure, and not only in dollar stores, sure. but you can get them full price at Amazon and it, and at it, it major bookstores. So the last question I want to ask you, because we have people that are very passionate about this and not as passionate, sugar. We didn't talk about sugar. Are you? Mm-hmm. A lot of people think a little is okay, and then you have people like Dr. Robert Lustig, or I heard pediatrician mm-hmm. Dr. Jake Gordon speak last night. He's a very famous pediatrician in Los Angeles, and he basically said sugar is poison. It affects every metabolic process in the body. The best amount is none. That's my feeling, but sugar is, is, is four calories a gram. It's a carbohydrate, so mm-hmm. you could technically still do your diet and include it, but what, but I think it makes people eat more as I do the salt. So what's what's your take on sugar? Well, it makes people it makes food taste good. So from that perspective, certainly it can um, make people eat more. But you can use it to help people eat foods they wouldn't otherwise like. So you know, you it's I'm I'm not going to vilify it the way some of your other guests have. Um, I think right. that it has a place in our diets. A lot of us are eating and drinking way too much. I think if you were going to make one simple uh, change to your diet to start managing your weight, I would get rid of sugary drinks. Um, sure. I think there's so many excellent substitutes that there's no need to consume your calories as sugary drinks now exactly. and that, um exactly. so you know it's it's an easy change to make and you know again if you can train yourself to like less sweetened foods and beverages that's terrific mm-hmm. it's it's win win but to blame all of our nutritional ills and our body weight problems on one part of our diet is that's going too far. Right. No, it's, I, just, it's, I love the. I just love your approach because it's just. Mm-hmm. You, you seem like just such a reasonable person, and I just. I just want to jump through this this screen right now and hug you. And <laughs> okay, we'll have a hug. We'll have and a virtual thank, hug. Right? Thank you so much. Thank you. I, um, I, thank you just so much for being here and for and for doing the work you do, which which really not only complements my work but really makes it possible. And I'll be sure to thank you really, uh, really greatly in my next book. Thank you so much for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ. I make healthy, taste delicious. And thank you so much, Dr. Barbara Rolls, author of all the volumetric books, for being here and for sharing your knowledge and your passion with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Nice to meet you.